And this is your host, Jeremiah, broadcasting live from Katy, Texas. And friends, this is such an exciting broadcast because we have so many moving parts. I'm doing a live remote broadcast across all of the Faith Radio Network right now. And I have three guests on my panel joining us, Dr. Scott Stripling, Professor Craig Evans, and Ellie Shukrone, all the way from Jerusalem. I'll be giving them a more detailed introduction in a moment. I welcome all of you listening to us across the Faith Radio Network. And I'm so grateful to be broadcasting live, as I said, from the Bible Seminary here in Katy, Texas. So already, friends, uh, so many exciting things that we can discuss. I've said in the past that we are truly living in the golden age of Christianity. Unlike any other religion or ism in the world, Christianity says that it is verifiable with history. Have you ever been in perhaps a university classroom or a Bible study setting or perhaps just having your coffee or at soccer practice with another parent who might say something to the effect of, well, you know, Christianity is a nice fable. Uh, it's a myth. It's certainly not rooted in history. It's certainly not verifiable. You know, that's a cute belief that you have, kind of like the tooth fairy or Santa Claus. And people often make these claims, and yet the power the influence, the impact of Christianity is that it is rooted in history. Our faith is indeed verifiable. And I have joining with us uh, the, today on the broadcast two world-renowned biblical archaeologists, one world-renowned historical Jesus scholar. We're going to dig into these things. But friends, I want to just remind you at the very outset, the first historian in the New Testament, Dr. Luke, who gives us 28% of the New Testament, he writes, he begins his gospel, his gospel this way, in Kippet in Latin, just means here it begins, kind of like a title page. Luke tells us in verse 4 that he was this collator of the documents. He went out and he tested the evidence of the Christian faith. He did interviews. He wanted to see if the miracles really happened, and he was preparing a document for someone he calls Theophilus. And listen closely, friends, to verse 4. He writes this so that you may know the certainty of the things which you have been instructed. You know what's beautiful about the Christian faith is that it interacts with history and it allows us to believe and it is an evidence-based belief. Are you struggling with doubt today? Have you had a difficult week or you have some challenges in your life? This program is going to be a great reminder of the historical and evidential bedrock for the Christian faith. We're going to discuss it because guess what? Other faiths, archaeology is really no friend to other faiths as it is in the Christian faith. And so, friends, I want to encourage you right now. This is your opportunity to ask questions. We're going to be taking questions from our live audience right here. Uh, and you can ask questions as well if you're listening at home or if you're driving right now. Our number is 877-933-2484. And don't forget, you can text me or email your, me your question at ask jjj.com. The mission of this program, the mission of Christian Thinker Society, is inspiring Christians to be thinkers and thinkers to be Christian. When we come back in a moment, we're going to discuss these exciting new discoveries that undergird and verify our faith. Stay with us. And Nat, can I talk to you for a sec? Um, it's it sounded when when the when when it first came up, it almost sounded like I was listening on a stereo, but now it sounds fine. It almost sounded like I was listening it to you on speakerphone or something, but now it sounds fine. Okay, 45 seconds. Jeremiah, what are the last four digits? Jeremiah. Sure. The last four digits of the phone number? 877-933-2484. Or they can go to askjjj.com, it comes right here. My wife says it sounds awesome, so we have her approval. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And welcome back to the program. This is your host, Jeremiah, welcoming everyone joining us from across the Faith Radio Network and also welcoming our studio audience. We're broadcasting here in Katy, Texas from the Bible Seminary. I encourage you to check out their website, www.thebibleseminary.org. Uh, friends, we have joining us today in our panel uh, a illustrious group of individuals who are archaeologists, evidentialists, scholars, and historians. And if you're just joining us, this is the Jeremiah Johnston Show on Faith Radio Network. I want to introduce our guests. First, to my immediate right, uh, for those of you that are watching on Facebook Live, is Ellie Chacrone, a, a renowned, excellent Israeli archaeologist who for years worked for the IAA, that's the Israel Antiquities Authority, excavator, scholar, and now a licensed tour guide. Uh, Shukran graduated from the Institute of Archaeology of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And as I said, what an experience, 25 years uh, of doing, working in excavations. And I do want to just give a plug for Mr. Shukron because he actually led our Houston Baptist University tour uh, throughout Israel and did such a great job. I know they've requested you again for their next trip. So, Ellie, we look forward to discussing so much with you about his immense knowledge of the ancient uh, Jewish history, uh, the city of David, the Pool of Siloam, which you discovered. Uh, friends, Jesus, if you open up your Bible to John chapter 9, um, healed a blind man at the Pool of Siloam, and that pool goes back seven centuries, stretches all the way back to Hezekiah. Ellie, will you say hello to the Faith Radio audience? Hello, hello everyone, and from Jerusalem, not where I'm used to. Yeah, but I'm, I'm bringing the only Jerusalem to the sun, so. Thank you. Hello everyone. Hello. And then uh, next to Ellie, if you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, and those of you listening is a, a dear friend of mine, Professor Craig Evans, prolific New Testament scholar, the finest Jesus uh, scholar in the English speaking world, certainly. Dr. Evans is well known for his contribution to gospels, historical Jesus studies, and he is the John Bassanio Distinguished Professor of Christian Origins at Houston Baptist University. Uh, Dr. Evans has over 700 publications uh, and many wonderful publications as well for the church and he teaches at Houston Theological Seminary. Dr. Evans, say hello, if you would, to our audience. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Johnson. It's good to be here, and it's great to be teamed up with Ellie Shukron and Scott Strickland, too. I've worked with uh, Ellie before in Israel, and we're going to be doing work uh, next year in the fall of 2019 with the Living Passages Tours. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I look forward to that very much. Good to be here with you. And friends, I want to encourage you especially to connect with Ellie and Dr. Evans and Dr. Stripling on social media. You can follow Dr. Evans right now at Dr. Craig A. Evans and Ellie Shukron on, on his Facebook page. That's Ellie Shukron, S-H-U-K-R-O-N. And then our final guest, a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Scott Stripling, who is indeed the provost here at the Bible Seminary. You do so much, Dr. Stripling, and you're a bodybuilder. I just don't know how you do it all. It's just so cool. Uh, friends, you don't want to meet Dr. Stripling in the dark alley, or maybe you do, uh, if he's on your side. Uh, but Scott serves as the provost, as I said, here at the Bible Seminary. He's also Director of Excavations and Associates of Biblical Research. I know you've received awards, your organization in the past, for having things like Discoveries of the Year, so I hope to get into that as well. Uh, he speaks at churches, conferences, and seminars. Dr. Stripling, say hello if you would to our audience as well. Thank you, Dr. Johnston. It's great to be with you, and um, just looking forward to hearing from Professor Evans and Eva Shukron, and this is going to be a dynamic time. Uh, friends, I want to start for our audience because we have many people that listen to this program, and some have just recently come into the faith. And they hear a word like archaeology, and it can be overwhelming. Or, oh my gosh, is this program, you know, I've, I've had problems with my kids this week, or I had to bail my kid out of jail. You know, how is this program going to minister to me? And I think it's so important that we guide our listeners and our audience by the hand so that they understand that Christianity is verifiable. Unlike any other religion in the world, except for Judeo-Christian belief, our faith says you can test us against history. Um, Ellie, can you talk for a moment about the importance of archaeology as it intersects with faith? Why is it important? First, you know, archaeologist is excavation, and you need to take the dirt to move the dirt to know where you are in the time. And of course, you know that we cannot prove everything that mm -hmm. that we think in the Bible we doing excavation. I know it. I, I, I was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to remind you, there's a lot of happening in the Bible that you cannot prove it. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing the excavation, you can prove a lot of detail, but not all the Bible. This this for one side. The other side, I say, the Bible didn't written for the archaeologist to prove it because the Bible, the Bible, 
And when you found something that you can prove in the Bible, it's fantastic. Yes. And this, this is how we need to deal by the excavation and by the, by the Bible, you know? Mm -hmm. And for example, it's, it's a very interesting story. And we already uh, uh, mentioned the Pool of Salon. Yeah, and the Pool please. of Salon, it's a very, very interesting story about that because from the fifth century, see, or AD, a queen of Dokia, she said, okay, I, I know where was the miracle with the blind man. She opened the Bible and she saw John number nine. And she said, oh, the Pool of Salon was in one place. And then she built, it's at the end of the Hezekiah tunnel, there's uh, some location, and she built a church there. And she said, this is the place. And the people came to this place. And of course, they're coming and praying and reading the Bible and all that kind of uh, thing that they're doing when they're coming to, to a place that someone said that this is a holy place. And then in 2004, I was surprised because 2004, we are a, I was walking in the Gion Spring, the other side of the city of David, and then I heard that they want to build a pipe inside in this area. But no one knows that this area is going to be what's happening after we found it. But the bulldozer was walking there and, the, the, and everyone, everyone, all the walkers around, they want to put the pipe, you know, the dirt moving. And, and then I was there and it was very interesting because I heard the bulldozer scratching the stone. I didn't saw nothing on the ground because you know bulldozer, it's, it's, it's every finger, one feet, and when you're walking, taking the dirt out. And then I heard the sound of the stone. I said, okay, it must be something. Wow. 2004. Think about five century, 2004. And then I stopped him and then, then I said, okay, let's check. And then, you know, it's walking, you know, you, you walking area. So the, the owner of the, that ate all that was, oh, what are you stopping me? I'm, I, you know, I want to continue walking to put the pipe. Let's go. You know? <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's Hold check, on. We, we have something here. We need to stop. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, we need to stop. I heard something. Oh, what are you hearing? You know, we heard something. Oh, okay. What he did is send one of his walkers and start to clean the dirt. And after a three inch fall, he said, oh, there's nothing. But you know, the finger of the bulldozer is one feet, not three inch. And then I said, okay, let me check. I say, this must be something here. So I cleaned it and I found three stairs. Mm. So everything was stopping. Okay, let's check the area. So we start to check the area and then I said, okay, because this area, it's in the valley. It's called the Terrapon Valley or the Central Valley in Jerusalem. It started in Damascus Gate all the way below the Temple Mount, all the way to the Kidon Valley. It's the end there in this, this location. And they say, okay, where we are in, how we can do the checking? You can do the checking from the north to the south. You can do the checking inside of the this area. I said, okay, let's do the this area because if there's anything there, we can find it. Yes. And, uh, and then 10 stairs, and then we open it. And Amazing. then we understand, you know, it's very interesting because you're talking about evidence, you're talking about finding, and then we found the coins, then we found the ceramic, and then we, oh, this is the place. So think about that way. From the fifth century till 2004, everyone going to Place. Wow, wow. And now it's just you amazing, there. you know. Yeah, and, and now they're going to the to the to the replace. So today if you are coming to Jerusalem to the Pool of Salaam, you can see a lot, a lot of people sitting there opening the Bible in the right place and reading John chapter 9. So, so it's fantastic. Friends, you've been listening to Ellie Shukron, who's right here at, at broadcasting live on the Jeremiah Johnston Show, all the way from Jerusalem. We're broadcasting from Houston, Texas. And you've just listened to the discovery of the Pool of Siloam from the very man who was there who discovered it and excavated it. Ellie, what a great thing. I know many people who are watching and listening have questions. We're going to be back in 90 seconds. And friends, I don't want you to change the station because... Did you know that the CIA and biblical archaeology have a few things in common? We're going to discuss it. Stay with us. Great job. Great job. We're on a 90-second break. Friends, if any of you have questions, just walk right up to that microphone, and we'll see you, and you can direct your question if any of you have it. Okay, we want to hear from you.
Are we doing that? And the other half, they're getting ready to excavate. Mm -hmm. I've heard they're going to excavate the other half of the pool. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, I just want to say, absolutely found it. So, what is the big issue to do? To do uh, you know, the second side of the, you know, it's a big deal. <laughs> Most important is the founders, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and give us some put it right there. Let's see. Go ahead and give us a level. My test, my test, my test. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Sounds good. Friends, welcome back. This is your host, Jeremiah. You're listening to The Jeremiah Johnston Show. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our podcast, and thank you so much to all those ratings. I uh, appreciate all the feedback that we're getting from uh, not only the live show, but the podcast as well. And I know uh, this is one you're going to want to listen to again, so be sure and subscribe to The Jeremiah Johnston Show. You can do that over at iTunes or Google Play. Uh, this is the program that inspires Christians to love God with all their mind and also gives them permission to ask questions. So I want to encourage you, if you have questions for the archaeologists, for our scholars joining the program today, you can call those in right now at 877-933-2484. Our lines are open. That's 877-933-2484. Uh, my guests uh, who are joining us, for those of you that are just coming to the broadcast, Ellie Chacron, archaeologist from Jerusalem, Dr. Scott Stripling, archaeologist and provost at the Bible Seminary, and then my colleague, Professor Craig Evans at Houston Baptist University. Dr. Evans, you've been in a number of debates and dialogues with individuals um, who say all kinds of things about the Christian faith. What do you say, and I want to set it up this way, when I think of scholars from the past, uh, for example, Bruno Bauer, who said that Jesus was a myth and anyone associated with him was also a myth, including Pontius Pilate. What do you say and how does that intersect with biblical archaeology? And gosh, talk about a gaffe from Professor Bruno Bauer. Yeah, it was one of the all-time gaps, I would say, because uh, everybody now knows. Of course, Pontius Pilate was a real person in history. We actually have a stone with his name on it that was part <laughs> of a dedication uh, right there in Caesarea Maritima in Israel. So the idea that he didn't exist is laughable. And same thing with respect to Jesus of Nazareth, the so-called mythicist. There are still a few with us to this day. And, you know, to deny the existence of Jesus, not only do you deny literature, Christian, Jewish, uh, Greek, and Roman literature from antiquity, but you, you have to ignore archaeology as well. After all, if the Gospels are just making up stories they don't, and the writers don't know what they're talking about, how come they get so much correct? Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm personally acquainted with Eli Shukron and a, at least a dozen other Israeli archaeologists and one of the things I find is they all the time reference Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts. These five books are in the New Testament. They reference Josephus, the first century Jewish historian. Why do they reference these works? Because they find them reliable. These works help them in their work of archaeology, which, by the way, is very laborious and expensive. So you want to know where to dig and, how, and to understand what you dig up. And so you're not going to follow myths and fables. You're going to follow reliable sources like the Gospels. And Dr. Stripling, I want to come over to you right now because um, when Christians hear archaeology or when people, for that matter, I think it's important that you explain for perhaps the skeptic who's listening, you don't get in some kind of Christian trance. You treat the Bible as you would any other historical document, and you go through the same historical method that you would if you were studying any other event. For example, I once lived in Franklin, Tennessee. The bloodiest battle of the bloodiest five hours of the Civil War happened at the Battle of Franklin. Five Confederate generals went down, and guess what? There are texts, there are artifacts, we have all kinds of unique things. There's a Civil War museum where we can actually see that this is corroborated with material culture. 
I want to come to you right now. How does that relate to the biblical culture? Can you just discuss what do you do as an archaeologist, Dr. Stripley? This is a question that I'm often asked. Um, being a person of faith, how do you do archaeology in a non-biased way? And I just laugh, but because I happen to believe that I can't somehow be honest in what we're finding, um, I was misquoted recently by an Israeli newspaper. I'm sure Ellie's been uh, in the same boat. And they said, Stripling lies outside the mainstream of Israeli archaeology because he takes the Bible as a serious historical document. Well, that was part of my quote. I said, we take text from Egypt seriously, we take text mm -hmm. from Mesopotamia seriously, and we take the text of the Bible seriously. And of course, they called out that a little bit. Yeah. Um, we're not seeking to prove the biblical text, but it does illuminate the biblical text. And we can't deny the relationship once we've excavated the material. Absolutely. And, and I want to just talk for a moment to Dr. Evans, to you, um, with what, in light of what Dr. Stripling just said, how does archaeology help us understand things better like Jewish burial traditions, the resurrection? How does this help us understand that what we actually read in the Gospels is authentic? Well, you know, when we understand the Jewish burial traditions, the customs of the Jewish people, that what that does is it uh, brings to life the uh, Gospel narratives. Because the writers assumed that the readers understood these things, and they did 2,000 years ago. We're the people who are far removed in time and culture, so we need some help. And when we uh, do our historical investigations, look at other sources, when we do the archaeological uh, work, like crawling around in the tombs and finding ossuaries and learning how the Jewish people actually did burial, we realize, oh, the gospel narratives fit that. The gospel narratives, like Jody Magnus, who's an archaeologist, she said that this, the, the way the gospels tell it, they tell it right. It's in step with Jewish law, custom, and the archaeological evidence. And that's what's so good about archaeology. Ellie, I want to ask you, and we, have, we only have a couple minutes before our next break, so we might have to get into it on the other side as well, but when we discuss people like King David, um, the minimalists in the past have said we don't know that there was a King David, very similar to the attack of, you know, Jesus as a myth. How would you reply, especially as it relates to King David? You know, the, 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 this was before the founding scripture in Tel Dan, in the north mm -hmm. of Israel, that mentioned the ass of David. Before that, everyone said, okay, David is not reality. David is not just a name in the Bible. And they start to write in books about that. Mm -hmm. But you know, thanks Lord, we're doing excavation in, in the excavation in the Tel Dan, it's not of Israel, they found the inscription. And that inscription, they mentioned the arms of David. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time that this, the name of David outside of the Bible. So everyone's starting to move in his chair and understanding, <laughs> oh, the arms of David. So, okay, let's, let's make it different a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a David. Okay, it's a real. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic that they say, okay, it's a real. But they're starting to say, okay, the kingdom of King David, it wasn't so big, uh, smaller. And I say to myself, after I listening all that time of uh, thinking and ranking and article, so who care about the size of the yeah. kingdom of David? David, it's real. Mm -hmm. The family of David, it's real. This is it. Mm -hmm. Mm. So there's a lot of discussion around, but I think now today most of the archaeologists, historians, say King David was real, the house of David gets realized. It's fantastic. Why? Because the finding that the founding tell done. It's amazing. It's like you know, before a uh, few years ago we found a, a bulla, it's a piece of clay that you, it's in the name of the city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem outside of the Bible. The name of Bethlehem. So the name of Bethlehem from the first temple period, you know that in Bethlehem, no, they didn't do excavation there, never. There is some excavation in the church of, uh, nativity. of nativity and that's it. Mm -hmm. So where is Bethlehem from the time of David? Where is Bethlehem from the time of Jesus? Mm -hmm. For sure, no one knows. And, uh, but, but we know the location, maybe it's the same location, but here we have a name that, that we can read it, Bethlehem. Fantastic. So we have the name of Bethlehem. We have the name of the house of David. So when you just connected all that together, okay, we talk about real city, real family, 
fantastic. Mm. It's incredible. Friends, if you're just joining us, my guests today are two archaeologists, Scott Stripling and Ellie Chacron, and we want to take your questions as well. You can dial in right now and ask your question of these archaeologists or a Bible scholar, Professor Craig Evans, or perhaps if you have an unanswered question, I'd love to take your call. It's 877-933-2484. When we come back, I'm going to discuss some of the attacks of the Christian faith have happened in light of the fact that some people believe that we just don't believe Jesus is a real person. Uh, and yet I've heard one of our guests on the panel say that if we can't believe in Jesus uh, as a historical person, we should throw out all we know or believe from late antiquity. I'm going to be discussing that in the next segment. Uh, friends, stay with us. You're listening to The Jeremiah Johnson Show. Great job, guys. So the New Zondervan handbook made a mistake and they credited me with excavating Bethlehem. <laughs> so it actually has been excavated according to the news. gave me credit. It says, it didn't cost me anything. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I've added it to my CV already. <laughs> Tad more, tad more. Are we good? We're good. Spot up. This is your host, Jeremiah Johnston. We are broadcasting live in Katy, Texas today from the Bible Seminary. So thankful to Dr. Lynn Lewis, the president of this seminary, for hosting us and our wonderful studio audience for participating. I have joining us today Dr. Scott Stripling, archaeologist and provost here at the Bible Seminary, Professor Craig Evans, distinguished professor of Christian origins at Houston Baptist University. And you'll notice his Israeli accent, my good friend Ellie Shakron. Uh, archaeologist, excavator, and now tour guide in the land of Israel. Um, Scott, how important is it that Christians, people of faith, visit the Holy Land? And can you just uh, put people at ease that it's probably more dangerous to go out in Houston, Texas, than it is to visit <laughs> the land of Israel? I don't know what that says for Houston. <laughs> Houston, but you're right statistically. It's a greater chance of having an accident on your way to the airport than there is of anything happening to you in Israel. Um, we, we've had numerous tours over the years. Um, twice a year many times, and we've never had an incident. Uh, very, very safe place, uh, even into the West Bank. I know mm -hmm. some tours are skittish there, but we're not. We, we, we go all over the land, and the importance can't be overstated. We call it the fifth gospel. Mm -hmm. So you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you have those lenses, but when you put on that fifth lens, then it comes into 3D. And when you move from reading the Bible in 3D, it changes everything. That's exactly right. Now, friends, how would I explain biblical archaeology? Well, I was actually looking at it last night. Um, how would I explain it? Well, what do explorers, spies, espionage, MI6, the Office of Strategic Services, battles, attacks, some cases, death, bribery, thievery, defamation, lawsuits, identity theft, what do all these have in common to my panel? Biblical archaeology. <laughs> in fact, I know a fellow Bible scholar one of our colleagues who was actually denied an insurance policy when the insurance company found out that he was involved in archaeology. In fact, was that you, Dr. Evans? Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know biblical archaeology. Uh, how do you explain that, Dr. Stripling? I mean, espionage, I mean, it's quite a history, isn't it? It's, it's bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Evans, I want to come back to you for a moment, because when the mythicists say that you know, we can't believe in Jesus. And we have thousands of people listening to this broadcast right now. They have children, they have grandchildren who have teachers or professors in the classroom who have said that Jesus is like Santa Claus. In fact, 
you know, a lot of our kids are educated, sadly, on social media. A prominent <coughs> singer recently said, you know, we can't believe in this myth, like Jesus, like Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, as a historian, as someone who doesn't privilege the biblical text, but you've checked it out, you've been to these lands. You know, can we believe that Jesus was a historical figure, and why? Well, of course we can, and we should, because the evidence is simply overwhelming. Uh, Jesus is on the same level, the evidence for him, that uh, had more, more evidence for Jesus than many of the Roman emperors. And, uh, you know, we have four biographies written in the first century. We have people talking about him who were personally acquainted uh, with him and with his family. Paul, the apostle, who was not a believer in Jesus and his movement, is converted and becomes acquainted with James, the brother of Jesus, for goodness sakes, even skeptic Bart Ehrman uh, in a book of his. Uh, Bart's a skeptic, and yet he says, of course Jesus existed, and if he didn't, don't you think his brother James would have known that? <laughs> uh, I think that really says it well, and you know, you have to, you have, to have a bias or an ax to grind to go in and say, oh, the evidence for Jesus is insufficient. Because if it isn't sufficient for Jesus, then Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great are in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Ellie, I want to ask you something, um, because we've actually written about this in a Fox News op-ed. Um, a recent Muslim cleric was recently quoted in the New York Times as saying that the Jewish temple never existed. How would you respond to that as an excavator, as someone who lives in Israel, Ellie, that there was no Jewish temple? <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was written in the New York Times, so it must be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of things written in the, in the, in the newspaper saying, you know, no, the temple was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of, you know, we have some kind of evidence. First, the, the location is the location, it's the same place. It started from the time of King Solomon, destroyed by the, by, by the Babylonian time at 6 BC, rebuilt again and destroyed by the Roman. We know the location, the temple was there on Mount Moriah, or Temple Mount, as we call it. You know, in, in, I did some excavation in the foundation of the Western Wall. Mm. And you know, we're talking about evidence, we're talking about artifacts. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about newspaper. Newspaper today, it's right, tomorrow it's not right. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, doing, yeah. they're doing different things with the newspaper. So I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the real stuff, yeah. real finding. And the real finding is a coins, a pottery, a, a other kind of finding. For example, we have in the foundation of the Western Wall, you have coins that date that it's to the first century. So you cannot say, oh, it's not from this time, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing some excavation there in the foundation in the north, southern part of the Western Wall. And it's very interesting because, for example, I found the golden bell. Mm -hmm. And what is the golden bell? So when I, you know, it's a very interesting story because when I found it, it's looked like, uh, it's looked like a bowl, but you don't know what's going on. So when I check it, I hear the, a sound. And I say, oh, immediately, oh, it's a golden bell. So everyone around me says, Golden bell? Oh, we know who had the golden bell. I said, oh, where, where, where I can find that? Oh, Exodus 28, they describe the dress of the high priest. Wow. And then on the bottom of the robe of the high priest, we have 72 golden bell. But it's very special because the Bible talking about the golden bell and pomegranate mm -hmm. and golden bell inside. Mm -hmm. So what it's look like? It's look like a pomegranate and the wow. bell in the wow. pomegranate. So who is used that? I priest. So we talk about the high priest, we talk about the golden bell. This, this golden bell was in the temple because it was on the robe of the high priest. So we talk about the temple. It's real. Of course it's real. It was there. Of course it was there. We have finding, we have a coin, we have evidence. We're talking about the reality. We're not talking about the newspaper. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. In front, no, it's, it's, it's a great point because if you're listening today and you're a Christian, you need not be silent when you hear a professor. To, listen, we need to be winsome to win some, as I always say, but we shouldn't be silent. And we have a faith that is rooted in evidence. We have a faith that says you can test us against history. If we, if we read everything, if we believe everything we read about the Bible, there should be fallout in the material culture, shouldn't there, Dr. Stripling? And what are some of the exciting finds that you've seen in the material culture that is the land, the Bible lands? 
Well, and just to go off of what Ellie was talking about, we found a pomegranate this year at Shiloh, which is, of course, where the tabernacle first rested for three centuries before the temple was built in Jerusalem, and right in the area where we believe that the tabernacle was located. And so it's it's a, a term that Dr. Evans and I like to use, verisimilitude. Yeah. It's, uh, you read about the, the text, and then you see a matching material culture. It doesn't contradict what we would expect it to be. To the contrary, if the Bible talks about a mountain, we can take you to that mountain, or a river to that river. And as you mentioned, not all faiths can claim that with their That's sacred right. writings, but we're, we're dealing in a real material culture. And I think it's important that Christians know this, and I understand that you know, we, can, we have to eliminate as much bias as we can. We want to treat the discipline with excellence. We even want to know the opposing arguments and reflect those in a positive way, even understand the, the, the people that argue against our faith. But at the same time, these things that you're saying, I can't help but get excited as a person of faith. Well, just a picture of this. You're excavating and you're bringing up coins. Sometimes we get as many as 50 or 100 coins a day. Uh, Pontius Pilate, Herod the Great, Herod Agrippa, Festus, Felix, all these people you read about in the in the New Testament, did, were they imaginary people? How did their images get on there? I mean, we didn't hide the coins there. Mm. These are real people. They re lived in a real world, and this is a real narrative. And these are not fables, and that's what I think is so important. And so if these events mm -hmm. actually happened, and they did, if there's evidence for them, wow, what does it say for our life and our belief system? It demands something of us, doesn't it? Can you talk about for a moment, Dr. Evans, if you would, um, the Dead Sea community? And I know we're gonna have to go to a break in a few minutes and we might have to pick this up on the other side of the break, but when we look at the Qumran community, we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, how important is that in reflecting back on the New Testament and Jesus and Judaica? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are hugely important for understanding Christian origins. For one thing, the scrolls, give us 38 of the 39 Old Testament books, and not, not completely, but uh, fragments, but it confirms that they existed. It confirms that the Hebrew text that they were written in was accurate. And, and of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls also uh, show us how the uh, Old Testament prophecies were understood, Messianic ex uh, expectations. And so all of this sheds light on, on uh, Jesus, the beginnings of the church, the writers of the New Testament, in a way that's very clarifying. If the New Testament was bogus, if we have a lot of myth, you wouldn't have a correlation with a real library that existed in Israel uh, in the first and second centuries BC. And when we come back, um, we've got to go to a 90 second break, Dr. Evans. I want to ask you about uh, the fact that we've discovered a new cave in the Qumranic community. Uh, this is the, the, I don't think we can overstate the importance of this discovery. I've written about it in the Fox News op-ed you can check out. Uh, and don't forget, you can ask me your question, 877-933-2484. We're gonna be back in 90 seconds talking to two amazing archeologists and prominent Jesus scholar. God bless you, thank you for listening. We'll see you in 90 seconds. You can call in with that question.
Welcome back to the program. I'm joined today on the Jeremiah Johnson Show by Eli Shukron from Jerusalem, Israel, Israeli archaeologist, Dr. Scott, Scott Scripling, the provost of the Bible Seminary and leads the Associates for Biblical Research. Uh, exciting things happening with this organization. And then my dear colleague, Professor Craig Evans, the John Bassanio Distinguished Professor of Christian Origins at Houston Baptist University. Friends, what a great conversation that we're enjoying. Um, Scott, I want to come back to you for a moment if I can, because um, as a New Testament historian myself, uh, recently I was giving a message on what we can know from the material culture about Jewish burial traditions and the fact that they shed light on the verisimilitude of the Bible. Now, I was attacked after saying this. How dare I believe that biblical archaeology helps us interpret Scripture? I mean, gosh, what, what, a, what a sin to actually believe that. And yet this is out there, and yet we don't say that about people that are studying other Greco-Roman texts, do we? It, it, it seems to be this attack, and I'm not trying to pick a fight here, but I've personally experienced, as, as I think most of the people on this panel have, why is that? Why is there this attack on, on finding truth, as it were, uh, or at least the evidence for the truth? Well, I'll, I'll give you a very direct answer to a very direct question. If the Bible is true, then the God of the Bible has a moral claim on our lives. And that's not a message that everyone's eager to embrace. Mm -hmm. How does it illuminate that? Well, just think about the stone vessels that we excavate. Some right over here in my office. And then we see in John 2 that the first miracle of Jesus, he's turning water into wine in stone jars. Well, dealing with the ritual purity issues, now we've got that material culture that's coming to life. When we're looking at the story in Luke 15 of a woman who had 10 silver coins. Well, we excavated a thousand coins at our last dig site. Only five of them were silver. Wow. And first century coins. This lets us know these were rare. And you see what that does to the text now. It doesn't change it. It illuminates the text. It's something of great value and rarity, which was the point of Jesus's parable, which is that we are of great value to him. Why people um, would resist that? I think it's because ultimately we have to deal with these issues of, of mortality and immortality. Does God have a moral claim on our lives? So powerful. And friends, if you're just joining us, um, this is a program you're going to want to listen to again. We've been discussing biblical archaeology. We've been discussing the evidence for the text of the Bible. Dr. Evans, you've done quite a bit of work on the manuscript attestation of the Bible, the actual textual art. And the, the text itself is an artifact, isn't it? Can you just discuss that for a moment and maybe even discuss the lifespan of these biblical texts, and even what we see in Qumran. I mean, the Qumran community had scrolls that had to have been more than 150 years old. Is that correct? Yes, that is very correct. Uh, some of the scrolls, a few of them might have been uh, close to 300 years wow. old when the Qumran community was destroyed by the Romans in the first century. We find the same evidence relating to New Testament manuscripts, and by the way, other manuscripts in the Greco-Roman world. Books were precious. We're used to throw away paperbacks that cost $10. You can buy them at the airport, read them once, toss it. That is not how books were viewed in antiquity. Uh, some large books that were well-made would, would be like buying a BMW today. Mm -hmm. You just don't throw that out. And so these books tended to last uh, 100, 200, 300 years, in some cases 500 years. We actually have archaeological evidence for that in Egypt where we do uh, stratigraphy. And these archeologists sitting next to me understand that. And what that means is if you dig down to a certain layer that's identified, let us say, as the fifth century AD, and you have a, find a basket of book rolls, book scrolls, that date to the first and second century, you realize, my goodness, these, these, scrolls, these books were hundreds of years old when they were thrown out. And so there's actual evidence that books indeed last a long time. What is the value for that in New Testament studies? I think it's highly likely that the original New Testament writings, what we call the autographs, the books written by the apostles uh, who wrote the Gospels, Paul who wrote his letters, were in circulation probably uh, for 200 years, mm. probably went out of existence when Emperor Diocletian deliberately had them destroyed in the year 303 AD. That tells us that, you know what, the text of the New Testament has been well preserved because the originals were around a long time and could be copied and studied. 
isn't this exciting? I mean, when you think about that, um, it's, it flies in the face of the skeptics, is, again, who say that, you know, these autographs, if they even existed, probably weren't around even in one lifetime. And I think that that's a powerful thing. And Dr. Evans, I know that we talk about that in the book we have coming out uh, very soon in 2019. Ellie, I want to talk to you for a minute because uh, not only did you work for the IAA, you now take Christians around uh, the holy city. Um, if, if for the mom who's just listening right now, and you've percolated a lot of interest, what are some of the most exciting sites uh, that a Christian should look at, a person of faith uh, in Jerusalem that you could point them to right now? Hey, go check this out. It'll really, it'll, it'll bring the world of the Bible alive to you. You know, it's a, we talk about the miracle of Jesus in Jerusalem. You know, it's, it's just fantastic. We're talking about the Pool of Salam, Pool of Bethesda, one north of the Temple Mount, the other one is south of the Temple Mount. That's amazing, you know, Mm -hmm. to open the book and reading the Bible, yeah. you know, sitting and reading the Bible in, you know, in the place. So, you know, Jesus put a mark on the eyes of the, man, of the blind man, go wash your feet. Mm -hmm. wow. This is the place. You can see there. You can see. You can. So the, the experience that you get in that place is it's just amazing. Of course, the city of David and connected to mm -hmm. the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the understanding, because this is the beginning of Jerusalem. Yes. So when we talk about the beginning of Jerusalem, everything started there. Mm. So it's just amazing to come, to see, to look, to walk through the water. It's amazing. Mm. And Dr. Evans, having listened to what Ellie just said, when we think about opening the Bible and visiting the land of Israel, I had this amazing experience in that I baptized my wife in the Jordan River. And what an incredible experience that was because so much was colliding at that moment. Here we are, we're looking at the biblical sites. We're opening our Bible. Now we're participating. And she says, would you baptize me in the Jordan River? I'll never forget it. And ever since that point, it's like our faith has been different, having visited the land of Israel. I mean, it just does something for um, our faith. As you just said, I'm sitting here at the Pool of Siloam, and this is where a miracle occurred, and it's written about in the Bible. And so, Dr. Evans, what would you say about visiting, again, the land of Israel and the Bible lands, how vitally important this is if you're listening right now to this or watching this program at home? I strongly recommend it because it brings the Bible to life. When you, you go to Israel, the Holy Land, you realize, hey, this is a real place. And sometimes people have in mind, as I think, an illusion about what it looks like. I can remember before going to Israel, I thought it would just be a desert. And I go <laughs> and there are trees, and, you know, there's forests. I couldn't believe it. I go to Galilee, the whole place is green. It's a vegetable garden. And I realized, boy, I had the wrong idea. And you know why? It's because a lot of Bible films are filmed in North Africa in a desert. <laughs> but the real Israel is a green place. So you got to go and see it and get a feel for it. And it brings the Bible to life. And that is really inspiring. It really is. And friends, we have one more break that we've got to take. But when we come back, I'm going to be asking Dr. Stock Scott Stripling about uh, some of the really exciting discoveries that he's personally been part of. I know you were awarded recently. Uh, recognized by Christianity Today, I think it was. So we're going to be discussing that. Uh, friends, uh, this is our final segment. Uh, stay with us on the Jeremiah Johnson Show. Good job, guys. I'm moving too fast. I was going first experience. I'm going to Israel. And you'll get on the bus and head to Jerusalem. Then you're in. But what? what where's the desert? <laughs> this is where's the camel? Where's the camel? <laughs> what? <laughs> I know why you Jerusalem archaeologists always say this is weird all the year. Shiloh is weird. <laughs> Long before Jerusalem. I suppose there was something. You know, it's very interesting. Because I found something from. From the tabernacle. But you know, whatever you post the program, how big was your film your film come? This was it's it's making sense because it's all in the world. Yeah. The design also making noise and the there's a bit of Give me another couple of years. Yeah. I just want to tell you something. It's not the time. It's the timing. Mm. 
Not to look at it. Yes. That's right. So, that. This is Jeremiah Johnston. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for all of you listening today across Faith Radio Network and hundreds of pastors and thousands of you who are listening on the podcast. Uh, friends, we've been discussing biblical archaeology, uh, but I want to end this final segment where we began in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, where Luke said that he had put together an orderly account. He actually said that he interviewed the eyewitnesses. He uses that Greek word autoptes. We get the word autopsy from it. He had looked at it up close. He had seen and discussed with the eyewitnesses the things that Jesus actually said and did. And isn't it remarkable that we only have about 23 to 24 days of the life of Jesus actually recorded in the Gospels? John actually comes along and he says, you know, if we wrote down everything that Jesus did, everything he said, all the miracles he performed, the libraries of the world would not be able to contain it. And it's fascinating to me when we open the Gospels, we only read, and they're just principal parts. They're not 24-hour days. We only read it about a little more than three weeks of the life of Jesus. And what an impact that that made on the world. And if you're listening today, be strong in your faith. Have a boldness in your faith. Say with Luke in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, I can have a certainty about the things that I've been taught, that there is an onus on us to love God with all our mind. That means that we need to listen to programs like this one. We need to invest our mind in our library. We need to read the Bible. You know, as I say on this program, there's a lot of people that send me questions about the silence of God and they're not opening their Bibles. The Bible is a living book. I need to get my mind in my heart and my soul in alignment with the word of God. And so the great question that you can ask yourself if you're listening right now is, is your mind is your mouth, is your heart in alignment with God's thoughts and God's words? Dr. Stripling, you have the final segment today uh, because you've been recognized recently, um, and thank God for all of your wonderful work in biblical archaeology. Tell us about this exciting discovery that you made that was recognized by Christianity Today and uh, how people can participate as well in what you're doing. Okay, well, thank you for having us on again. This has been a fantastic uh, exchange of ideas. We, in 2013, excavated the number one artifact uh, in Israel for that, that year, at least uh, in the perspective of Christianity today. It was a scarab, and a scarab is about the size of a quarter, it's shaped like a beetle. Uh, the Latin word scarabus means beetle. And it has the iconography of a pharaoh on it. And the reason that they're important, if you can get them from a, a sealed or a clean locus, and in this case it was a sealed locus, only about 5% of these scarabs come from a sealed context, so we know it's not contaminated. We can do absolute dating with that because we have very good dates for the different administrations in Egypt. So we were able to date this scarab to Amenhotep II, the 18th Egyptian dynasty, which then verified the dating that we had been doing ceramically. And so many people had sort of criticized our ceramic dating because it also was in step with the Bible. How could this possibly be? Uh, what you're calling late Bronze Age pottery is actually Middle Bronze pottery. And of course, Ellie and I were talking the continuation of pottery forms. This can be very tricky. But the scarab essentially verified what our dating had been. And the Fortress of Ai was built and destroyed when the Bible indicated that it was. Mm. So it was terribly exciting. Wow, so exciting. Friends, we're out of time today, but I want to thank Dr. Scott Stripling, Professor Craig Evans, Ellie Shukrone, all the way from Jerusalem, and I want to encourage everyone in our audience, connect with these men on social media, read their books, follow it, and friends, thanks again for listening to another broadcast of the Jeremiah Johnston Show. Next week, I interview Pastor Rick Renner, who has one of the largest churches in Russia right near Red Square in Moscow. Never forget, you can love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. We'll see you next time. Thank you. All right, great job. Yeah. 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 Yeah.